the medical system. The doctor as you know him, to mark its 35th anniversary, the U.S. magazine entitled Foreign Policy, it's kind of one of these political foreign policy magazines, comes out monthly, been around for a long time, asked a group of think tank people at universities to study and identify which ideas, values, and institutions will disappear in the next 35 years. Guess which is number one? Guess which one's going to disappear for sure, for sure, in 35 years? Medical doctors. Now, there's always going to be heart transplant surgeons, there's always going to be orthopedic surgeons, but it's the primary care physician, the family doctor is gone within 35 years. Who's going to take their place? We are! Because we can deliver. We can deliver. And of course, we know because we rank 46th in the world now in health and longevity, they flunked. Doctors lie to get insurers to pay. They send in bills for things they didn't do. They come to Vegas, they lose $10,000, go home Sunday night, Monday morning, they put in a bill to the insurance company on your insurance numbers. They pay $10,000. He can pay his mortgage and his car payments and everything. He doesn't lose a, a lick. You try to do that. They put you in jail for insurance fraud. They don't go to jail. Doctors, according to Harvard Medical School, 52% of medical doctors, licensed medical doctors, 52% of licensed medical doctors are on drugs or intoxicated with alcohol at any one time. So if you see two doctors in one day, you don't know which one was drunk. You don't know which one was on drugs. What you want to do is look at the pupils of their eyes instead of their degrees on the wall. <laughs> you want to see if they're really wound out on something. And because they're wound out on drugs, 52% of them at any one time, this is a Harvard study. This isn't me. They make a lot of mistakes. They can't even tell if you're alive or dead. And especially when organs are in great demand for transplants, they might not want to know if you're alive or dead. Hmm. So you don't want to check that little box on your driver's license. The study finds that doctors skip key steps of treatments, 50%. They don't do 50% of the things they're supposed to do for you for simple things like high blood pressure and diabetes. They get paid for the full thing. What would you do if you go to an automobile dealership and you pay for 20 things to be done for your car, you're down the street and you look at it and you say, wait a minute, I paid for 20 things but they only marked 10. You turn around, you go back and say, did you make a mistake here? Oh, no, no, things are so costly and we figured you only wanted to pay so much so we took that money but we only gave you half of what you paid for. You'd be kicking the counter. You want to see the manager. You want your money back. You're going to call the state attorney general. I'm coming back with my lawyer. But let a doctor do that to you. Well, he's a doctor. According to Harvard Medical School, not me, November 1996, examining the casualty count. If you look up the word casualties in the Webster's Dictionary, it says military killed and injured in battles. Why would they use a term like that for hospital deaths? Hmm. The annual toll of medical harm in U.S. hospitals, one year, 1.3 million physical injury and 180,000 killed. Three years later, November 1999, medical mistakes were the eighth top killer of Americans behind cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, gastrointestinal problems, liver problems, kidney problems, and doctors. But they did improve. You've got to give them credit. They did improve. Three years later, December 2002, doctors were no longer the eighth top killer of Americans. They moved up to number three because they went from 180,000 killed each year in hospitals to 250,000 killed. This is a study by Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and Hygiene, which is a department of the medical school. Now we're number one. Yeah, we're actually number one because they kill 728,000 every year. Remember, we are now ranked 46 in the world in longevity. Two million of our Americans are infected each year in hospitals at the hands of doctors. Two million because they don't wash their little hands. They just don't wash their hands. They're busy. You know, they take a pee in front of a toilet. When you flush that toilet, there's an aerosol. It gets all over their white coat, their tie, their, their shirt, their little clipboard they're carrying, their hands. They don't wash their hands. There's a line there. I've got to see a patient. They run to see you. They walk at you and they want to look at your eyelids. And so when they start walking at you, either in their clinic or your hospital room, and, and you see them pass the basin, they don't wash your hands, you want to stop them. Back off! Don't even come near me. How many people did you kill last month, you know? <laughs> Hold their feet to the fire. And despite heroic round-the-clock nursing care and intravenous antibiotics, 100,000 of these people die. Each year in America, 2.2 million untoward or bad drug reactions which means about 40 life-threatening drug errors each day uh, in hospitals, in every hospital. 2.2 million, and despite heroic care, 140,000 to 200,000 die. Now, I don't know how quick you are with numbers, but I'll give you the tally. That turns out to be 5.8 million casualties inflicted on the American public each year in the doctor's workplace, the hospital. 5.8 million casualties each year in America killed, injured, and infected in the doctor's workplace, and they've never had an OSHA ticket written against them. You would not tolerate that. Oh, but you know, those terrible mine explosions in West Virginia where 14 men got killed. What a, it was a tragedy. But I mean, there's the safety board, there's the OSHAs in there, the mine inspectors, uh, Senate investigations, House of Representatives studies and all this stuff going on. Those mines may never open again. 
And here's one trade in their workplace, inflict 5.8 million casualties every year in their customers, and nobody could give us stuff. Well, who's going to save them? We are. Hua. It's up to us, folks, because if you're expecting doctors to say, well, we've been wrong all these years, and we're going to start using vitamins and minerals now, and we're not going to do that nasty, nasty, dangerous surgery anymore. We're not going to use drugs. We're just going to use herbs. Now, if you think doctors are going to do that, you're living in la-la land. People always tell me that, well, doctors are coming around. I saw a doctor on Sanjay Gupta uh, on uh, uh, Fox News said that uh, there's a good herb out there. Well, that doesn't translate to doctors doing anything. That's me when I was 18 years old. Didn't have a gram of fat on me, and I did have a flat tummy at one time in my life. <laughs> Captain of the wrestling team on the weightlifting team. I actually played middle linebacker on the football team when I only weighed 127 pounds, but I made up the lack of weight in meanness. <laughs> Exercise without supplementation is suicide. What do all athletes do regardless of sports? They sweat. And if you're sweating and you're not replacing all that soup of nutrients that are coming out in your sweat, you're doomed to either break down like Theo did. Thank God he didn't die. But he broke down physically because all the nutrients required to maintain and repair his cartilage and ligaments and tendons, connective tissue and bone and, and muscle weren't there. And so he broke down under the stress of all this high performance activity. You give him all this stuff back, he, he kind of regrew everything. Isn't that amazing? What a concept. Exercise without supplementation is suicide. Many of you remember... The Grinkoffs, really good-looking couple, Russian couple, they were the darlings of the Paris figure skating world. He died of cardiomyopathy heart disease at age 28. Won four gold medals, two in the Olympics and two of the World Games. Had everything going for him. Money, fame, bam, 28 dies. Cardiomyopathy heart attack. What's that caused by? A deficiency of? Selenium. Very good. Walter Payton died of liver disease, waiting for a liver transplant. Mr. Clean never drank, never did drugs, was a gentleman. But he sweat, and he just drank water are the dark side, Gatorade. Uh, I love this crowd. <laughs> and it's really, these are tragic stories. This gal here, Rolanda Pierce, 19 years old, great basketball player for Florida State University, 19 years old, a freshman, six foot five, had all the moves, good looking, very bright young woman. She was expected to be kind of the Michael Jordan of the WNBA. She was going to be the, the female version of Michael Jordan when she graduated college and got into the Women's National Basketball Association. She died of a ruptured aneurysm at 19 years of age. What did she die from? A copper deficiency. Exactly. All the money and all the future and all the potential she had went away because she was living on Coca-Cola and French fries and no supplementation because the sports medical doctor at that university told her you can get everything you need by eating your basic four food groups. French fries, Coca-Cola, fried chicken. Reggie Lewis had it all, captain of the Boston Celtics. Had his first cardiomyopathy heart attack, 28 years old, collapsed. They gathered together 12 of the best cardiologists in the world. They called them the dream team of cardiology, paid them a million dollars each to refer all their patients out to other doctors so they could devote full time to Reggie. They wanted him back on the floor. He was a powerhouse. He was a leader. He made things happen. And he was kind of like the Theo Ratliff of those days. And what a great kid he was. Clean as you could be. A great example for everybody. But while they were arguing... Who is going to get famous by doing the heart transplant or installing a pacemaker? He dies of his second cardiomyopathy heart attack two weeks later. Well, God has a great way of bringing justice to the evil. A year and a half later, the captain of the dream team of cardiologists, one Dr. W. Thomas Nessa, taught cardiology at Harvard, ran the Boston Marathon every year, was as fit as you could be, a person who believed in fitness and so was a fitness nut himself, dies of a cardiomyopathy heart attack in his home at age 48. Now, if he was my cardiologist and he said exercise without supplementation was good, I would lay on the couch. I would never blink. I would not do anything that resembled physical activity. If he said salt was bad, I would take the top off the salt shaker and I'd be guzzling that stuff. If he said eggs were bad because of the cholesterol, I'd be eating 25 a day because I wouldn't want to wind up like him. Even though he was an expert, he's a dead expert. And they don't lie. They don't lie. <laughs> Wilma Rudolph, another Olympic legend, Died of brain cancer at age 54 after winning three gold medals in a single Olympics in the 19, was it 1960 Olympics? She died of brain cancer. Nope, not arsenic. Nope. Gallium. Ah, I can tell who's reading the book, Rare Earths Forbidden Cures, Chapter 11, under G, gallium. It's a gallium deficiency. Big British study. I cite the study, no doubt about it. Corey Stringer, 350-pound offensive tackle for the Minnesota Vikings. Had it all, rich athlete, but they wanted him to lose 50 pounds so he could play for a string that year. 
So they put him in a rubber suit, didn't give him any water and didn't give him any salt. 102 degrees, Minnesota in the summer in August, and he collapses with heat stroke. Everybody has a cell phone, 911. Here comes the ambulance. Five or 10 minutes later, they arrive. Now, Corey weighs 350 pounds, and they hook him up in an IV. Boy, they got the EMTs. They hook him up to an IV. Is that enough fluid for him? No. What they should have done was taken that big Gatorade bucket full of ice, put it on him. They should have ripped his trousers off and stuck the hose from the garden up his rump and give him a cold water enema, bring his core temperature down from 107 to 98.6, and Corey Stringer would still be alive today. But everybody's waiting for the doctors to do it. Now, if there had been an Eagle Scout there, he'd have lived. But all poor Corey had was the top sports medicine doctors. 